Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we'd like to start our side event international seminar, uh, Blue Carbon Ecosystem, Conservation, Restoration, and Sustainable Use, Sharing Good Practice and Collaborations between Japan and Africa. At the outset, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Atsushi Tsunami, uh, President of the Ocean Policy Research Institute and Executive Director of the Sasakawa Peace Foundations to make uh, welcome and opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Tsunami, please. Ohayou gozaimasu. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for coming to our side event this morning, um, in spite of the uh, bad weather, but I hope that uh, this morning the transportation was smooth. Unlike yesterday, we had a little bit trouble uh, yesterday with the, yeah, some of the cancellation of the uh, uh, trains and so on and so forth. But anyway, um, uh, it, we have uh, uh, today um, Excellency uh, Dr. Naoko Ishii, CEO and Chairperson of the uh, Global Environmental Facility, and uh, distinguished speakers, representatives, and delegates from African countries, and dear colleagues and ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to warmly welcome you all to this side event entitled Con uh, Conservation, Restoration, and Sustainable Use of Blue Carbon Ecosystems, Lessons Learned and Possible Collaboration Between Africa and Japan. Once again, I'm uh, Tsushi Tsunami, the uh, President of Ocean Policy Research Institute and Executive Director of the Sasaga Peace Foundation. I'm very pleased to um, announce that uh, OPRI organized this, this event a side event with the Climate Change Policy Headquarters, City of Yokohama, at the occasion of the 7th Tokyo International Conference on Africa Development uh, here in Yokohama uh, this morning. Um, blue carbon is the carbon captured and stored in coastal marine ecosystems, such as seagrass beds, mangrove forests, and salt marshes. Uh, the term was first uh, defined by the ep epoch-making UNEP report published in 2009 and uh, has gained international attention from both policy and science communities recently as a way to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Uh, to climate change. And the IPCC, the United Nations body for assessing the science, related to climate change, will finalize and launch a special report on the ocean crisis sphere in the uh, changing climate this September, and blue carbon will surely be included based on the best available science in the report. After the Paris Agreement was adopted in 2015 at COP21, the momentum has been accelerated to keep the increase in global temperature well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase even further to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Importance of the uh, ocean for the mitigation for and adaptation to climate change has received uh, more attention lately, which is um, manifested by the number of events taking uh, place during the UN meetings. On Ocean's Action Day during the COP24 in Poland in 2018, we, OPRI, hosted a blue carbon event in collaboration with the Conservation International, Global Ocean Forum, IUCN, and IOC UNESCO at the Japanese Pavilion. Responding to such international momentum, Japanese experts group reported the uh, first evaluation of blue carbon ecosystems in 2018 and the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport, and Tourism has established in the expert committee in June 2019 to discuss on the road of blue carbon to combat climate change. The government of Japan also referred to, uh, to seek the possibility of blue carbon as a carbon sink in Japan's long-term strategy under the Paris Agreement. While the scientists have uh, started to shed light on the values, uh, values of other coastal ecosystems, including seaweed beds, as a new blue carbon ecosystem, seaweeds gives, uh, give us uh, various ecosystem services such as food supply, nutrient and carbon removal, and oxygen provision, uh, and carbon uh, sequestration and reduction of ocean acidification. Inclusion of uh, seaweed blue carbon widens the area of stakeholders to be involved for the wise and sustainable use of coastal ecosystems and resources in the world 
uh, ocean. African countries have a great potential in, the, uh, in blue carbon. Tropical areas of African continent have wide areas of mangrove and seagrass ecosystems, and high latitude uh, areas has extensive seaweed ecosystems. But these coastal ecosystems are de uh, degrading rapidly due to land use changes and res resultant sedimentation and overuse and conversion by a growing human population pursuing short-term incomes. Seaweeds are abundant in coastal areas of Namibia or South Africa, for instance, but they are overlooked or, or underutilized. Wise and sustainable use of blue carbon ecosystems would benefit local coastal communities in the long run while addressing the climate mitigation at the same time. I hope that this side event uh, it uh, enables us to reinforce our joint endeavors to promote sustainable use of blue carbon ecosystems by sharing good examples from Japan and Africa. I look forward to the vibrant discussions at this side event and productive collaboration with you all in the future. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I'd like to thank Dr. Atsushi Tsunami, uh, president of the Ocean Policy Research Institute, uh, for making uh, welcome and opening remarks. Um, my name is Masanori Kobayashi, the senior research fellow of the OPRI, and I'd like to briefly introduce the, today's theme, um, that is blue carbon. Uh, blue carbon, as uh, articulated by Dr. Tsunami, uh, it uh, refers to uh, like a biomass. Uh, in the coastal areas and also the underground water uh, areas, uh, such as um, seagrass, uh, kelp, uh, coral reef, and also mangrove is also uh, considered as a very important component of the, um, the blue carbon. And nonetheless, um, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Tsunami, uh, it is also considered as a very key uh, aspect for sequestrating carbons as a mitigations of the climate change. Uh, on the other hand, that the methodology itself is not uh, clearly articulated yet. Uh, therefore, uh, it is not really easy to quantify the carbon uh, sequestrated through the blue carbon. Um, that is a challenge that has to be uh, further clarified and articulated and agreed upon uh, within the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change process. At the same time, a number of colleagues who will speak uh, after us uh, will uh, present the uh, cases where actually there are multiple benefits of uh, conserving and uh, sustainably using uh, blue carbon. Uh, for instance, the seagrass, uh, while we can also sequester the carbons, there is evidence that the fish stock that live with the seagrass has actually returned in the province such as uh, Okayama uh, Vizen uh, city. And uh, there are some other areas um, that also demonstrate the restoration of a fish stock that is accompanied by the restoration of the seagrass. Uh, in Hokkaido, um, there's a case uh, where the restoration of the coastal uh, vegetation such as uh, uh, black pine have actually uh, arrested the soil erosion and by arresting the soil erosions, uh, they could actually reduce the sedimentation in the coastal area. And by reducing the coastal uh, area sedimentations, they could actually uh, enhance the productivity of the kelp. That is also a very important source of income for the fishermen in Hokkaido. So there are some other economic benefit. Uh, in Bizen, um, there is a case uh, where the uh, school teachers, <clears throat> they work with the local fishermen and the local junior high school student. And they work together to restore the seagrass. And by interacting with the fishermen, they have to write a report. And by doing it, uh, there is a proof that the uh, junior high school students have actually improved their writing skills, uh, speaking school, and uh, increased uh, uh, the scores in the educational um, the school test. Uh, th that is another aspect of the social benefit. Uh, local students have also 
had a better understanding of their local communities, they have more compassion to support the community development in uh, Okayama Vision City. So a number of uh, socioeconomic benefits are also associated with the environmental benefit. Um, that is a very important uh, <coughs> part of our work. Um, so um, today, uh, our colleagues will further discuss uh, these issues. Uh, uh, December last year, uh, Dr. Tsunami and our colleagues, including myself, uh, went to Katowice, the COP24 of the Climate Change Conference, and there uh, we had uh, um, uh, discussions on this blue carbon. Uh, you'll see the like, uh, uh, publications on the blue carbons, and uh, we had enriched discussions over there. Uh, so uh, we have been undertaking uh, some case studies as well to see what are the really the multiple benefits and enabling conditions for achieving the better conservation and sustainable use of uh, blue carbon in coastal and uh, marine ecosystems. And uh, today we have a privilege to have uh, Ms. Naoko Ishii, uh, Dr. Naoko Ishii, who is the CEO of the Global Environment Facility uh, that has been providing a catalytic and a very important instrumental funding uh, to enable particularly developing countries to address climate change mitigation adaptations and the biological diversity conservations, including marine uh, biodiversity. I have now a distinct pleasure and the privilege to introduce Ms. Naoko, Dr. Na Naoko Ishii, the GEF CEO. Please warmly welcome her with a, a big applause. Thank you so much for the very warm introduction uh, to me, and thank you so much uh, the OPRI and the Dr. Tsunami for inviting me to this very, very timely uh, session. Why so timely? Uh, because the, finally, the world is waking up and notice the importance of ecosystem, nature and ecosystem, which does include the blue carbon. So today, I want to talk about that and why we need to actually seize this opportunity, this attention which is really rising in the global community and how we could really translate this attention towards the concrete actions. So I want to talk about three things. First, the scientist call. Second, the call for action. Then what exactly we can do to seize this opportunity. So let me start with a call from the scientists. I think that we all know in this room that the, the scientists continue to send the alarming bell to the global community, and clearly, more clearly, and also the loudly, that the, it was just in this May, IPBES, this UN uh, scientist community uh, uh, working on the biodiversity, issued a report and clearly recognized that actually the importance of the ocean to safeguard that the biodiversity, and it was just a month ago that the, the report uh, by the high-level panel for sustainable ocean economy also highlighted that then how important it is to safeguard the ecosystem and uh, uh, to safeguard and <clears throat> the important um, the ecosystem um, for, um, and they particularly in, uh, recommended that then we need to invest in nature-based a climate solution by restoring, the protecting, and managing coastal and marine ecosystem that sequester and store carbon, adapt to the, um, to, to the effects of climate change, and improve the coastal resilience. So there is tons of scientific message coming from the scientist world, or academic world, to continue to alarm the world. The good part uh, is that then now that then also call for action is being heard, being heard the louder and also the clearly. Uh, you may have heard the 30 by 30 initiative or 30 by 30 narrative, and, but interestingly, I, I understand there are three versions of this 30 by 30, and, that, and let's see that now which one you have heard. That one, um, actually, that then, um, uh, the one of those 30 by 30 was actually the study conducted by TNC, the Nature Conservancy, and their 15 uh, institutions, partner institutions, and their study found that 
nature-based solutions provide up to 37% of the emission reduction needed by 2030 to keep the global temperature increase below two degrees Celsius. So that is the first version of 30 by 30. But there is another call of um, 30 by 30. The need for ocean conservation was highlighted by IUCN, and they called for the 30% protection of the ocean by 2030. That's the second version of 30 by 30. But the third version, which I found most interesting, is actually now the business joining this call, or the 30 by 30. For the past few, actually, that are uh, maybe months or the maybe two years, um, the Global Deal for Nature and its people is now called and joined, the business community joined, uh, the conservation community to how to seize this opportunity. Um, this and um, their call is to how to um, increase the protection, protected areas to 30% of the earth land area, which includes the mangrove, and by 2030, to have real hope of keeping the climate change and that is dangerous zone in their definition that the 1.5 degree Celsius and how to prevent the world ecosystem from unraveling. So these are at least three versions of 30 by 30, but interesting point is that it is really a journey from scientist to conservationist to now the business sector joining it. So I think it's very, very important for this community to really seize this opportunity to translate into those call, a message from science, and the call for action into the very concrete uh, the, uh, actions on the ground. So what kind of things we should do to concretize their, um, their interest? At least I can think of three things, and all of them are very much coming from the GEF's experience on the ground. And I hope some of them actually touch uh, upon what you have been doing. Um, doing. So that the first one, is that we need to uh, come up with a comprehensive and multi-sectoral spatial plan for ocean space. We can organize multi-stakeholder platform to map out uh, economic, social, and ecological characteristics of the shared marine area to identify where fishing or mining or recreational activities occur and hoping that then we could negotiate and agree on the special plan to promote the blue economy. It may be sounding too maybe ambitious to you, but in fact, we have been working together to realize this kind of activities. One uh, recent example is to support Western Indian Ocean Strategic Action Program in developing marine special plan for at least five coastal zones in their, in their ocean. The second area that I think we should really work together is to articulate economic value and social benefits of the conserving and sustainably using marine ecosystem in addition to ecological value we all come to know. Um, we have some good example in this regard. The Benguela Current Commission, which covers Angola, Nambia, and South Africa, has this, and now this commission, and they did this exercise of economic valuation of their resources, their marine, um, uh, large marine ecosystem, and they come up with the value is US dollar 2.2 billion and 75,000 jobs per year. This valuation actually the spur the political and the policy and the business interest, and they actually excited very much that and how we could really use it. So um, then that the one very concrete outcome of this uh, valuation study is that uh, they now um, uh, uh, lead that the Benguela current convention. Convention actually help the policymakers to come up with a very concrete policy actions, including how to ensure sustainable fisheries to that uh, where they can actually uh, stop that uh, our district uh, fishing and waiting to, to the, the fish stock to restore. And they can also did, they, they also did that and, uh, how to do the marine protected areas. And they also come up with that uh, um, a contingency plan to how to manage oil, spirit, oil spills, which was actually that then uh, already in action. So another interesting example that which Jeff is supported 
is Blue Forest Project, uh, which provides the first global scale assessment of the values associated with coastal carbon and ecosystem services. And there are five countries and uh, several sites, including Indonesia, UAE, Ecuador, Madagascar, and Mozambique. And this valuation was actually used to improve ecosystem management through um, public awareness, actually, and also inform the decision making by, uh, uh, by public sector, and also focusing cooperation among stakeholders. Um, now, my last point, that the uh, where uh, of the what kind of things we can do together is actually that, the, that we need to deploy much more act aggressively, actively and aggressively, the private sector investment. This is easy to say, but it's very difficult to mobilize. Uh, luckily, I think we have so far accumulated several interesting uh, financial in, uh, innovative financial mechanisms, such as measures such as that uh, the uh, social uh, blue bond. This is not just the simply the um, greenwashing or blue washing, that uh, the community actually come up with the Seychelles long-term plan to how to utilize their natural resources or blue economy. And then uh, uh, the we are very much uh, interested in their governance mechanism and economic and scientific calculation by actually managing their live um, marine stock very carefully that, uh, that they should be able to pay back the blue bond. So it's a very good example of the social blue bond. And we hope that uh, we can replicate those kind of examples to other ocean nations. Um, that then I'm also personally very much interested in seeing the size of the insurance uh, sector to come up with an uh, the instrument to how to safeguard coral reefs together with the tourism sector. So this is another idea I think that uh, we can continue to work with. So uh, in conclusion, I think that the fact I'm talking about is that uh, not necessarily the nitty gritty part of how to uh, evaluate the economic value or the value of the blue carbon. It's much more about why this community needs to seize this incredible opportunity and coming from scientific community, coming from conservation community, and finally coming from business community, that how we could really concretize this passion into the actual concrete measures so that we can really build on the, the, um, the, the great foundation for the future prosperity. So I hope that the, um, the Jeff example, that the experience, is something that the lay out some foundation for us to continue to work uh, for this very important area. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity, and I uh, wish that a very successful deliberation uh, for this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Uh, Naoko Ishii, the CEO of the Global Environment Facility, um, referring to a very interesting uh, project, uh, Blue Forest, and also uh, she underlined the importance of involving uh, insurance and the finance sectors in acknowledging and uh, uh, conserving uh, coastal ecosystems. Uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for sh sharing a very insightful uh, perspectives. Now uh, we will proceed with uh, five persons who will make a presentations. Uh, first, uh, representing the host city of the TCAT 7, I have a pleasure to introduce Mr. Shuhei Okuno, uh, Executive Director of the Climate Change Policy Headquarters of Yokohama City. Uh, Mr. Okuno, please. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. Uh, my name is uh, Shuhei Okuno, uh, Climate Change uh, policy headquarters uh, uh, Yokohama City. Uh, I'm very glad to attend to this uh, seminar. Uh, the city of Yokohama is uh, working hard to implement global warming countermeasures uh, last year. Uh, we set the goal zero carbon Yokohama to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, today, I will explain the uh, Yokohama Blue Carbon Project, uh, which is one of the important efforts to achieve our goal. Okay. Uh, Yokohama City has a coast line with a total length of about 140 kilometers. Uh, most of the coast line has uh, 
various logistics facilities and uh, natural coastline is only a part, uh, south area. There are uh, attractively used, uh, such as the uh, International Triathlon. I will explain the initial social uh, conditions uh, that exist uh, when we launch the Yokohama Blue Carbon Project. Uh, globally, uh, we uh, faced three issues. Uh, next, uh, Blue Carbon was uh, first advocated by the UN, and it pointed out the positivity of using marine plants uh, to counter global warming. Uh, one, uh, on the other hand, uh, Yokohama faced the following challenges, uh, enriching the sea and growing uh, industry, uh, straining uh, emissions, uh, sorry, uh, reduction emissions of uh, greenhouse gases and uh, straining uh, residents, residents' attachment to the local area. In order to meet uh, these challenges, we set three goals. Uh, number one, uh, improving, improving the city brand, uh, increasing tourism, and highly valuing environmental education. Uh, to achieve these goals, the Yokohama Blue Carbon demonstration experiment was launched in uh, 2011. Okay, next, I will tell you about the aim of Yokohama Blue Carbon project. Uh, until now, uh, in the sea at Yokohama, uh, citizens and companies have uh, actively uh, cleaned the uh, seashore uh, and formed uh, or restored a seaweed bed, uh, creating a rich ocean with improved water uh, quality and greater biodiversity. Uh, the Yokohama Blue Carbon Project has aided the goal of absorbing and reducing CO2 to uh, these activities and operates a unique carbon offset system. Expressing the quality of CO2 absorption uh, and reduction as monetary values through the sales and purchase of credits, uh, funds are obtained, obtained uh, and the project is publicized, stimulating the activities of citizens and companies. This initiative is intended not only for environmental purpose, but also contribute to a more comfortable society and boost the Yokohama brand, while on the economic side to boost supplies to resource and food and attract more tourists along with various other co-benefits. The Yokohama Blue Carbon Project is built on three frameworks. First, uh, blue carbon. Uh, second, uh, blue resources. And third, uh, creating friendly ocean. A blue carbon uh, advocated by uh, the UN, uh, and it is intended to absorb and fix CO2 in marine ecosystems. Blue resource means effectively using energy on coastal lines and using marine project product as food. A friendly oceans uh, refer to event. Uh, conducted to publicize blue carbon and blue resources. The Yokohama Blue Carbon Offset System has been uh, operated since 2014. Uh, this system offers uh, credit in exchange for CO2 emission reductions 
achieved uh, through local production for local consumption, wakame seaweed, and the tugboats with uh, environmentally friendly energy. These credits uh, are used as carbon offsets for events such as an international triathlon held in Yokohama City. Uh, specifically, first, uh, participants enter by adding an environmental contributor to their event a participation fee. Second, uh, their contributions are used to offset the CO2 emitted by the participants. Travel to the competition site by public transportation and the operation of the competition itself. Third, through the sales, uh, sale and purchase of credits created by uh, representing uh, CO2 reductions in monetary form, activities to conserve the marine environment are stimulated. This uh, slide shows the result of operating the Yokohama Blue Carbon Offset System. The offset transaction related to carbon dioxide equaled 3.1 tons in 2014, but have now grown to 164.4 tons. At first, they were purchased by only two organizations, but this is now done by 11 organizations. As my final topic, uh, I will talk about the reduction of greenhouse gases and other effects related to challenge and future initiative. In the current situation, the credit using blue carbon itself cannot be operated. Our goal uh, for the future is to expand credits using blue carbon. The reasons uh, for this is that uh, effect other than the uh, reduction of greenhouse gases are greater when blue carbon is used. We amuse that uh, because Japan has not uh, established uh, uh, abs absorption, abs absorption uh, intensity necessary to uh, represent blue carbon by credits we will represent uh, blue carbon by credit. After the absorption intensity has been established, as other effects, now uh, the importance of the sea is shared with only some citizens, so we wish to share it, is, it, it with uh, more citizens to expand en environmental activities. Another matter being considered is uh, improving the attractiveness of its rich ocean, so it will be a special future attracting tourists. But because this attractiveness is not shared <coughs> with citizens, so we will inform many citizens of it. To resolve this dilemma, uh, we hope to increase PR uh, through events and environmental education. The city of Yokohama will, be, uh, will use blue carbon to improve urban development in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Okuno. Uh, we also visited one of the sites uh, near uh, Kanazawa Hake. Uh, last July, and uh, they really had a very uh, extensive seagrass covers in that area, uh, close to the amusement park uh, um, uh, over there. And uh, if you have a chance, uh, please uh, also visit. Uh, it's a very nice place. Now I have a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. James G. Cairo. Uh, he's the chief scientist of the Kenya Marine and Fishery Research Institute. Uh, we have a pleasure to invite you. Uh, thank you. Good morning, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me again. 
we were here yesterday learning about carbon trading, and I'm happy even to hear the city of Oklahoma, they are also trying to sell carbon. Uh, today, I'll be dealing with a bit broader issue on how do we mainstream a uh, blue carbon ecosystem into climate change agenda. And by climate change agenda, I'm talking mostly SDGs and NDC. My name is James Cairo from Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute, and I'm also the coordinating lead author for the chapter five of the special report on ocean, which uh, the Jeff was uh, alluding to. And I'm also the Pew Fellow for the 2019. Yesterday, we talked about that, uh, that 70% of the ocean uh, is, uh, of the earth is covered by the ocean. And we have many ecosystems, mangrove, seagrass, and salt marshes, among others. And those are the key in achieving SDGs and Paris Agreement. So when you have the resilient one, they'll be able to achieve the 17 goals. And yesterday, we also learned about where they are. And they represent a very small amount, mangrove seagrass and coral reef, uh, mangrove seagrass and uh, salt marshes represent just 0.5% of the ocean surface. But they contribute 50% of the carbon in the ocean. That's the carbon that is, drives the fisheries, that drives the productivity of the oceans. And when you compare uh, what is there, you compare the mangrove, the most important thing about blue carbon ecosystem is that their carbon is stored in the sediment. Well, how we could, what we are calling about carbon capture is the normal process of photosynthesis. So they are capturing and storing. But because the area is anoxic, no oxygen, it can be stored for millennium. And you can see in that graph the different types of mangrove, and it's comparing it with the terrestrial forest. And you can see the value sometimes ranges a lot. And even the small mangrove area you have, some dwarf mangrove, like the one you have in the Indo, uh, in the Indo Pacific, they are dwarf. You can see the back, the, the below ground carbon is still huge. And that's the most important. So when that carbon is degraded, they are emitted. This is what is happening most of the area uh, of the world. And this is the Southeast Asia because of uh, aquaculture. And the worst, worst thing, the shrimp aquaculture produced here. It's not even consumed here. It's consumed to the developing world. Uh, but the, when the disaster strike, like the tsunami, what happened, it will strike here. So the, what we are saying is, when you have such destruction, conversion of mangrove to other land uses, you emit so much carbon dioxide, and you also affect the livelihood. You affect the biodiversity. So my, they say what we are talking now, the narrative is, can we have first mangrove, can we harvest the social, can we harvest the fisheries at the same time benefit with the biodiversity and carbon capture? If you look, this is the paper that changed our thinking. If you look at how mangroves have been degraded around the world, mangrove salt marshes and sea grasses, and you look at the level of emission, they're emitting 0 0.15 pentagram. A pentagram is 10 less to 12 if you want to know. And the amount of carbon emitted by destruction of this critical ecosystem is even higher than emissions of a country like Japan. So it's that significant, but it's not known. So that's why I really loved the first presenter, the presenter from Jeff, talking about the new thinking that we need to conserve our, social, our coastal ecosystem because of their rich carbon reserve. This is where the world is going. The, uh, towards the AR5, Assessment Report 5, there are three reports that the uh, IPCC have, have commissioned. One is called 1.5, that has already been released. We have a uh, uh, special report on oceans, and, uh, and that's the one I was coordinating, Chapter 5. It's coming in September, so I will not discuss it by policy of IPCC. But we also have the special report on land. All these reports are telling us that the land is heating. This is 1.5 report that the, the, we, we, uh, when we do nothing, the temperature is continuing increasing. The current level is at 1.5, but IPCC, the Paris Agreement, want to lower it. Look at where we are. And if we continue like that, the temperature is likely to hit three. We need to do something. And I was looking at the African condition, because uh, in the perspective of the uh, TCAD, 
you look at the, using the bold scenario, RCPs, you can see the African is heating up. If by the 2030, there will be, the, the Africa will be really heating. Already we are heated at 2.6 uh, RCP. What are the five deadliest effects of global warming? And these are being felt everywhere. We have the melting ice, economic consequences, like a loss of revenue, increased probability of intensity of drought, warming waters, and definitely there will be diseases. And this is cross-cutting. Some people, that I can understand, I was in one of the presentations yesterday, the shipping company, they are very happy because the ice is coming down and they'll be using the short route. But what's the consequences of other biodiversity? So are we doing enough? Look, we are, by Paris Agreement, we need to bring the temperature to 1.5. But to make the temperature 1.5, we should be able to absorb 45% of this crop temperature, of these CO2 emissions. And then we should continue using a, a renewable. So the question is, are we doing enough? We are not doing enough. And even if we absorb everything, the temperature will continue increasing. And that's why we are bringing the new narrative. We start thinking about the blue carbon ecosystem. Because they are rich in carbon stock, because they are rich in a carbon storage, this ecosystem can store carbon in the atmosphere and at the same time can support biodiversity and for that they can be helpful in mitigating climate change and also in accelerating development in the coastal zone. And we have opportunity to do that. Uh, our, the, the lady from the GF talked about the guidelines that have come. I'm involved in several guidelines like this one. There's no option, there's no reason why a country should not be able to assess their carbon. This is, a, this is the report, uh, the guidelines from the, we call it the, the Brook Carbon Manual. You can, it's free downloadable. It's guidance on suffering and analysis. You can, you can assess your carbon. There's a mission, we have given you even a mission level. We can how to manage the data so that a country will know how much carbon it's emitting and how much carbon it has in their country. So that you'll be able to calculate like what the Oklahoma country, uh, city is doing. And also, we have the IPCC report. I was also involved in this in 2013 supplement, chapter four, talk about coastal carbon. So there's no reason why countries, and the, according to Paris Agreement, they are encouraging countries to use these guidelines to be able to assess, report, and monitor their carbon stocks. And based on that, um, many countries are, are moving on. If you look at the, 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 the this, this was a, if you look at the NDCs, the NDCs, 28 countries are using mitigation, uh, blue carbon uh, as a mitigation measure, and 59 countries, mostly from developed countries, are using them for the, the adaptation. And we hope this one will continue and moving forward. It's good to run because of time. I want to show you what other people are saying. For instance, I, uh, this is uh, the economists they are saying mangrove is not just a tree, mangrove is life. And I agree. And if you look at the uh, BBC saying, let mangrove recover to protect coast. And I agree. And we have the even Toyota mangrove. They are planting mangrove in millions here in Japan. And I agree. And this is the political will. I remember before I came here, this is the government, the ministers were there planting mangrove with us. And finally, what are the opportunities we have? This is my last slide. The opportunity is that when we plant mangrove, when we restore blue carbon ecosystem, it's a cheap option of low carbon, of low carbon pathway. And if we are to reduce 50% of our mangrove uh, loss, will be gaining 2.3, uh, 0.2 gigatons, which is like offsetting Spain. If we return our carbon to what was there in 1990, you can see it's like we'll be mitigating 7.7, 77.4 uh, million tons of coal, which is that, that's how significant it is. And it is not expensive, it's financially viable, that's why you say it's four to ten dollars per, t per tons of CO2, making it possible to support those countries that has a mangrove to restore them. That's why I'm really happy when I see the corporate world, the Toyota, the Mitsubishi, supporting mangrove restoration in those countries. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Dr. James Cairo, uh, for uh, sharing your views on this uh, blue carbons. I see this conflict of the land use. People want to combat it for the short-term benefit. Uh, but yeah, we have to acknowledge this long-term benefit of the coastal ecosystems. Um, I have now pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Tsushi Tsunami, the senior research fellow. Uh, Tsunami is our president, excuse me. <laughs> Atsushi Watanabe. <coughs> yeah, we have uh, several Atsushi uh, in our office, excuse me. So Atsushi Watanabe, uh, senior research fellow of OPRY, uh, who will pr uh, present to you the um, blue carbon uh, conservation, uh, restoration, and wise use uh, as a basis for promoting blue economy. Uh, Dr. Watanabe, please. Uh, thank you, Kobe san for introducing me. And uh, I'm Atsushi Watanabe from the Ocean Policy Institute. I will be uh, presenting about the conservation and the wise use of uh, blue carbon ecosystems for realizing blue economy. Yeah, as uh, many previous speakers mentioned, blue carbon ecosystems are represented by seagrass meadows or mangrove uh, ecosystems, uh, according to the definition of UNEP report in 2009. But I would like to propose to include coral reefs to the blue carbon as a part of the blue carbon ecosystems because they are linked to each other. Uh, for example, mangrove forests uh, trap sediment from the terrestrial uh, area and uh, uh, keep the water quality uh, good in the uh, offshore coral reefs. And uh, coral reefs protect the uh, uh, shore from the high waves and uh, uh, create a calm condition behind the coral reefs, which is suitable for seagrass or mangrove uh, habitat. Okay, so and, uh, recently, uh, world scientists are trying to include seaweed as a new uh, blue carbon ecosystem. I think this uh, will be explained by my subsequent uh, speakers, uh, so I will skip this, but uh, need more science to include uh, seaweed in blue carbon, I think. Okay, so uh, this is a blue carbon sink potential uh, uh, estimated by Japanese researchers in 2018, uh, led by uh, Dr. Kuai of the Port and uh, Airport Research Institute. Uh, in Japan, the most uh, important uh, carbon sink is uh, uh, seaweed, followed by uh, tidal flood, including salt marsh, and seagrass bed, uh, mangroves, uh, which now uh, capture CO2 of 1.7 to 6.8 million tons per year in 2018. But if we can uh, conserve or uh, use the, this ecosystem in a sustainable way, it can increase to 2.0 to 9.1 million tons by 2030. Okay, and uh, to uh, put the blue carbon ecosystems into uh, national agenda, it is important that to the mitigation of CO2 aspect is very important. But for the local people, if we want to uh, involve local people to participate in the conservation of the blue carbon ecosystems, I think the co-benefit or ecosystem services from blue carbon ecosystems are more important. For example, coral reefs give an, or mangrove forests give a as, act as a natural breakwater and uh, protect the coastline from uh, high wave energy. And uh, pristine or healthy uh, blue carbon ecosystems provide uh, food to the local people and uh, it can be uh, it can act as a nursery ground for the uh, and the f small fish and give a high biodiversity. It even uh, purifies the water, remove nutrients from the water, and uh, also uh, remove pathogens uh, from the water. And it gives uh, cultural services, like it can be used for the uh, school kids curriculum in some areas. And it, of course, it can be useful for the tourism resources. Okay, and uh, to uh, achieve sustainable blue economy uh, for the sustainable development, blue carbon ecosystems uh, 
key. I mean, they create a natural capital in coastal areas upon which sustainable blue economy could be achieved. So, for example, uh, uh, mangrove forest or seagrass bed uh, can be used as a uh, recreational, I mean, the, used for tourism, marine tourism, and also it gives a better uh, fishery or aquaculture catch it. And uh, if we do, you do the ship building, uh, mineral resource development, or something, you have to uh, consider if it will not damage or impact uh, uh, this blue, other blue carbon uh, component. Okay, so let me explain about some good examples from Japan. Uh, first, from Bizen City in the Okayama Prefecture. I will take you, oops, I hope it works. I will uh, take you to the Bizen City. It is uh, about five hours from, uh, oops, oh, it's not working. Yeah, okay. So, uh, Bizen City is uh, located in the, Oh, Okayama Prefecture and facing Seto Inland Sea, which is a, a island studied area. So we have very beautiful uh, islands. And uh, here people are uh, harvesting oysters. Okay. And, uh, but here, uh, sea grasses were abandoned in the 1950s, but uh, it uh, was eventually lost due to the land reclamation or becoming the, uh, due to the uh, but. Uh, but water quality. In 1985, the, the, most of the seagrass beds were lost. And the local fishermen realized that the seagrass bed are uh, associated with the fish catch. So uh, local fishermen started to restore seagrass bed from the 1980s. And uh, it didn't succeed uh, very well in the first stage, I mean, about 20 years. But uh, from 2006, Five, uh, seagrass bed started to uh, recover, and uh, also fish species associated with seagrass bed, like uh, crabs or squid, were, uh, has also recovered. Okay, uh, okay, I have to skip this. So, uh, restoration of seagrass bed gave a good, stable oyster catch since 2008, and uh, oyster also uh, purified the water and uh, give a. Uh, good condition for seagrass bed. So, and also unique point of this uh, activity of this area is that the junior high school student uh, participate in the restoration program. And then uh, local fishermen are very happy to give them a lecture about, and then introduce about their activity to the local kid. And uh, uh, okay, so this kind of uh, continuous effort by fishermen and the inclusion of multi-stakeholders like fishermen, scientists, and junior high students are the success factors in this area. Okay, uh, let me move on to oops, uh, Onnason in Okinawa Prefecture. This is for south of Tokyo. And here it is famous for coral farming and also cultivation of mozuku, uh, unique Okinawan seaweed. Yeah, and uh, here uh, in 1998, coral reefs were uh, degraded due to uh, coral breaching. And the local fishermen also didn't catch a good amount of mozuku in that year. So local fishermen noticed that by experience that they can harvest more mozuku when coral condition is good. So they started to uh, uh, use a, create a mozuku fund and that they sell the mozuku uh, nationwide, and 1% of the revenue is used for the uh, coral transport plantation or eradication of predatory sea stars or uh, uh, protection of soil land north. Okay, so this area is using the coral reef zonation wisely, and the sustainable use of coral reefs in the ditch to reef manner or source to uh, sink MANA is uh, carried out in collaboration with local fishermen, academia, tourists, and divers. And the financial mechanism, Mozuk Fund, is unique and connect locals with uh, consumers. Uh, okay, so these are the success factors learned from the good examples. Uh, continuous long-term efforts or restoration and sustainable use of environment by local fishermen in partnership with multi-stakeholder is a key success factor. 
and the sustainable financing mechanism or the wise uh, spatial use of coastal environment is key. Okay, uh, so thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Atsushi Watanabe, for sharing uh, the part of our research work on this uh, sea uh, grass and uh, blue carbon, and also promoting a uh, blue economy. Um, we have now a pleasure to introduce um, Professor Daisuke Fujita uh, from the uh, Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology, and he will tell us the multiple benefit of the um, CRG uh, uh, in uh, marine ecosystems. Uh, Professor Fujita, please. Hello, everybody. I'm Daisuke Fujita from Tumusat and uh, president of the Japan Kaiso Association. Now I'd like to talk about the various benefits from seaweed ecosystem, although I'm not related to any project of blue carbon. <laughs> Okay, you know that the macroalgal beds are widely distributed along the coast of Japan, affected by the two warm currents, uh, Kuroshio and Tsushima current, and Oyashio, the cold current. So in the north, uh, cold temperate area, the kelp growing, and the other, most of the parts of Japan are warm temperate and vegetated with the uh, warm temperate species of kelp, or sargassum. And in the southernmost areas is the subtropical, okay? And geridium or agrophyte is also popular. Oh, I summarize the benefits from macroalgal beds. Uh, I usually <laughs> use this table in my lecture. So first important is the primary production by photosynthesis, the capture of light energy and fixation of carbon. And the second is the absorption absorption of nutrients, so fixation of inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus, so that prevents eutrophication or red algae, or red tide, okay? And the third is the food supply and nourishment of heavy wood or the composers and human beings, particularly Japanese. And engineering is the uh, providing substrate interspace and color, uh, moderation, and biological selection and export of the seaweed bed cosmos to remote communities. Ma, I'd like to show you some slides. <laughs> that means it, I don't know. Uh, this shows the primary production by the large seaweeds and absorption of CO2 and producing the oxygen and absorption of nutrient is another importance. So nutrients are supplied from the mountains, forest, through the rivers, or from the upwelling uh, by, uh, from the deeper area, also by vertical mixing, okay? And if the nutrients are stored in the seaweed beds, uh, regenerated and reused, recycled, and food supply is the largest. And they can support many animals, including herbivores and decomposers. I'd like to introduce you for the special case for Japanese later. And for engineering, uh, by branching and rooting, so many animals can live within the seaweed beds by inhabiting using the microspaces. And for moderation, so they can reduce the light and wave energy. And so they can uh, promote making the very safe, comfortable space under the canopies. And biological selection. So the seaweed bed can uh, control the feeding or settlement and metamorphosis of many invertebrates uh, by using the chemical signals or the special structures of dominant species, okay? Or using the antibacterial or antiviral substances, they can 
make a very, very clean surface of the seaweed. And the seaweeds, if uh, detached from the original space, uh, they are carried uh, far away by the ocean current. So the floating and bottom drifting and stranded seaweeds are often uh, produced. And then the fish eggs are spawned onto the floating or the many fishes are carried out uh, under the canopy of floating algae. Yellow tails are also present, or well, flying fish is also present. This is the table showing the Africa to Japan in comparison of size and macroalgal harvest and culture. You know that the Japan is a very, very small country in, by means of the area, and the coastline is nearly the same. The large area, uh, large Africa, and a very small country. In the coastline is nearly the same. But <laughs> seaweed harvest and culture is much larger in Japan than in Africa. Okay? So the Kaiso is the very, very important for Japanese. So they, because they containing umami or minerals or dietary fibers and other functional compounds. So we have the 1,400 species, domestic species, but uh, more than 100 species are eaten by us, okay? And because of this, we Japanese are very healthy and the longevity of Japanese is third in the world. Yeah, these are the macroalgal foods in Japan. And uh, these are the general constituents of macroalgae. So many, many various useful products or substances are produced from the algal tiles. So we enjoy in various ways. Né? Most of uh, these species are né? traditional, mass productive, and used in the various kinds of food. So the Japanese food is selected as one of intangible culture heritage in 2015. So these are the reasons to be selected. Umami or kelp soup is the very important point, I think. You know, all of these, uh, in all of these food, yeah, seaweed are more or less used, okay? And these are also important, the hydrochloids, the slimy substances from the series are used in many uh, items in our study or in our life. So in Tokyo, we have many impressive seaweed shops, nori shop or aga shop or restaurant. So please enjoy <laughs> yourself, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fujita, for telling us uh, the, the recent trend of Japan's uh, seaweed productions and the restorations. <clears throat> I have now a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Gunta Pauri. Um, he is uh, uh, representative and president of the Zeri Network. Uh, I understand originally Zeri stands for Zero Emission Research Institute. Uh, he is well known uh, in Japan and uh, uh, worldwide. Um, he is very innovative in um, providing uh, ideas uh, for the sustainability and uh, uh, waste management. And today uh, he is discussing these linkages between uh, microplastic and uh, uh, seagrass seaweed uh, utilizations. Uh, so, Dr. Gunta Pauri, uh, please take the floor. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. Dr. Tsunami, and thanks you for having me. Um, while they're looking for my file on the paper here, um, we will be arriving in Japan with uh, this boat, and from Japan we'll go to Dubai, and then we go to Northern Africa. Basically, I'm coming to talk about one particular experience we have, is that uh, for the past 25 years, we've been involved in seaweed farming. 
Actually, we started on Zanzibar, uh, close to you. We're in Pemba, Mafia, and Zanzibar. We have 17,000 people working on the growth of seaweeds. And seaweed growth is very much affected by global warming. Because as the temperature rises by one degree, you have to move out into the ocean. That means that people can't wade in the water anymore. They have to use small boats. We started in Morocco a large seaweed farming project. And we realized in the south of Morocco, in Layoun, that the growth of the seaweed was much below the expectations. And we realized that the growth reduction by up to 60% was due to the adsorption of microplastics. 12 microplastics per centimeter cause an immediate reduction in the growth of the seaweed. So not only are we losing the space for farming seaweeds, we are losing the efficiency of the growth, which normally is light and nutrition, but now you have this blocking agent in between. So while it was bad news for the seaweed, it was good news because we found a way to actually eliminate and start eliminating microplastics from the ocean. We should not forget that whatever we have discussed is further exacerbated, complicated, because microplastics will invade everything. And since it's invading everything, all your good plans, like Yokohama City presented here, will have to take into account a much reduced biomass production because of the bioplastics. But the good news is, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. The good news is that we are able to move forward with these initiatives because we design a new business model. I'm very happy to hear that government and businesses involved, but we have an urgent need to get entrepreneurs involved who are prepared to take risks. You cannot only work on the basis of solid science. Science has to give you a direction, and then you need to have a business model that supports the initiatives. I just wanted to show very briefly this picture, because please don't think that Gunter Pauli does all of this. <laughs> I have a team of 3,000 people, and we're very much inspired by leaders around the world. I tend to be the one who speaks the loudest, though. <laughs> but this boat is for us a very symbolic arrival. I will just go through through this in a very short moment. When we realized during our voyage around the world, a voyage to call the world's attention to the problems of plastics, we only wanted to use renewable resources. The boat is actually operating, and I will not go into details, with the technology of the yo-yo, the know-how of the cuckoo's clock, and the a tremendous skill of the kite surfer. Over coffee later on, we can discuss that in more detail. But what I think is important to show to you is that around the world, we really have this issue of microplastics invading everything, but really invading everything. You don't realize that when you drink one liter of water from a, from a plastic bottle called PET, that you are ingesting between three and 10,000 microparticles of plastics, of which five to 6% will stay in your body. That is what we call mummification. You turn your body into a mummy before you even died. And I think this is one of the reasons. This is recycled pet bottles textile. We need to get rid of these, they're already in the ocean. And the only way that we have found now to remove the microplastics is indeed seaweeds and seagrasses. 
That means in all the great functions that we have seen, there are additional opportunities that arise. We have tested on sargassum, on eclonia. We have tested on ulva. This is the ulva seaweed. We have tested on fucus seaweed. We have tested on all of these. All of these seaweeds, laminaria, all of these seaweeds are massive absorbers of microplastics. Now, the question is, what's the business model? How are you going to face a reduced income because less growth of seaweed, less food? And Fujita, Professor Fujita, thank you so much for your presentation. It is always great to see how good and important seaweeds are in society. But now the question is, what is the business model? And ladies and gentlemen, this is where we have first of all worked with Danish institutions to delicately specify what is the absorption rates we have and how can we remove. So today there are two ways of removal. When you have 12 microplastics per square centimeter, then the removal can either be with hot water spraying your seaweeds before, as very much is done in Japan to prepare for the seaweed to be eaten afterwards, but you can't remove everything. The only way to remove it is to go through an anaerobic digestion. Now this is, I would say, good news. These are tests from Connecticut, United States. These are the sites in Layoun in Morocco. These are the type of curtains that we create. And we have different curtains in different circumstances that we can use in order to accommodate to the exact site so that we create what we now call the seaweed curtain. The seaweed curtain becomes a microplastic curtain. I don't have time to go into much detail because the lady in front is swaying with her one minute now. <laughs> but I need you to see this. This is in Pater Noster, South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, Japan has not done research on these subjects in detail. South Africa has, Morocco has, Tanzania has. And I think the interesting element is though this one chart. We know there is a lot of demand for renewable energy. And what I didn't hear Fujita-san talk about is that one of the greatest components of biogas is actually seaweeds. So we are simulating mathematical models whereby we can see thousands of square kilometers of seaweed farmed and have all the benefits that have been mentioned but including now the benefit of creating biogas. That is the revolution. Because if it's full of bioplastics, you can't eat it. I don't recommend you eating bioplastics. And so what we though see in the models we have run in South Africa and in Morocco, we have succeeded in beating the cost price of BTUs compared to shale gas. Now that's the business model. Japan is a major importer of natural gas. Japan kicked up the prices for natural gas. What we're seeing is the opportunity to start supplying the natural gas from seaweeds because it's a precondition to remove the microplastics. But second, as we've seen in the charts from Professor Fujita, seaweeds are great absorbers of phosphorus. That means we're in the capacity to substitute phosphate mining with the solids that are left over after the anaerobic digestion. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a snapshot presentation. This is the first time I presented in public. It's never been sent before. Tomorrow, I'm giving a press conference on this at the Swiss Embassy here in Tokyo. And tomorrow noon, I have a one-hour special session to explain all the details at the EDGE. And there are two representatives here from the EDGE. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gunter Pauli. Uh, may I invite the panelists to be on the podium? Uh, Gunther, please. Uh, I always admire Gunther's innovativeness and ingenuity now linking um, uh, seaweed uh, with the microplastic and even biogas for tackling both uh, uh, microplastic uh, pollutions and the climate change uh, pressures. Uh, very much uh, inspiring uh, talk indeed. Um, I have a pleasure to have all the three, four speakers uh, on the podium. Um, I think uh, we are getting a bit uh, running out of time, uh, but uh, uh, we will see uh, how far we can go. Uh, but I, I'm just wondering if uh, three speakers, uh, uh, you may have some reactions to the uh, Gunther's ideas about uh, applying these uh, CVs uh, to removing the uh, microplastic and even use it uh, as a source for the producing biogas, uh, that would probably uh, give uh, uh, some other uh, multiple uh, socioeconomic or maybe environmental benefit. Uh, do you have any reactions? Uh, maybe James, you, do you have anything? That was very Uh, th thank you, Guda. Uh, definitely, it's the first time I'm also hearing, and uh, also the link between the uh, microplastic and uh, um, uh, the algae. Now, my worry is what will happen to a society like Japan, which depends so much on seaweed, and also in our society when we are planting, when we grow, so, because even Tanzania they're doing that, Kenya we are doing that. So uh, there's that. Confusion now, shall we be propagating microplastic? You see, the challenges, the challenges that microplastics are invading everything and everywhere. Let's be realistic. Primary and secondary microplastics are invading everything. The science is very solid on how it gets into the air, how it sticks to the trees, but it's in the liquid that it has the highest density. So the only species we know that is adsorbing and not absorbing is the seaweed. It doesn't get into the body, it sticks on the pores. And that is a very unique feature because it means the removal is much easier but we want to capture and destroy. It may take a hundred years for us to clean up the oceans, <laughs> but the only one who has the power is nature, and nature is the one who gives us the seaweeds. The advantage is we have simulated already for Morocco that with 3,400 square kilometers of seaweed farming along the coast, Morocco will be 100% self-sufficient in energy. It would be a zero emissions energy base. Now that may take a generation, but that's the direction we want to go. We want to get rid of the fossil fuels. And by the way, you never heard me speak about carbon sequestration. It's obvious we're going to do the carbon sequestration because that is what seaweeds do so well in nature. Okay, so interesting point, and um, yeah, I probably assume that uh, Dr. Watanabe and Professor uh, Fujita may also have uh, some more points to add, but maybe uh, we just open the floor as uh, we are a bit running on time, and uh, it may be a bit unfortunate uh, not to receive uh, comments or reactions from the audience. So if you have anything uh, to uh, ask or make a comment. Uh, can you raise your hand and, and identify yourself? And uh, uh, please uh, be brief uh, in uh, making your uh, question or uh, comments. Nihongo demo kamaimasen no de, moshi ko shitsumon go iken to aru kata irashai mashita ra kyosho o negai itashimasu. Okay. Um, so, uh, do you have a microphone? Uh, uh, okay, it's working. Sorry. Um, well, I love the topic of seaweeds and I found it very, very interesting. Um, but I was wondering about like uh, microalgaes and 
what's the possibilities of uh, phytoplanktons, for example. Um, and like, I think there is more than macroalgae for um, making new change in our society. So uh, do you have any initiatives related or any um, projects going on with that? Okay, Thank so you. it's not necessary to uh, remove the microplastic, but more about uh, sequestrating carbons. Yes, right. Yeah, okay. Uh, we actually had a workshop in Palau uh, two weeks ago, and there we had a colleague uh, specifically focusing on this uh, uh, phytoplanktons. And uh, I think it, it was very interesting to listen to him, that uh, he said that uh, when the seawater temperature goes up, in some areas, the oxygen levels goes down, yeah. and uh, with the reduction of oxygen levels, uh, there may be a less uh, phytoplankton. Um, so there may be some correlations uh, also uh, between the changes uh, in the marine environment and also this uh, abundance and density of phytoplankton. Uh, yeah, maybe, Gunther, do you have anything to add? Very important to differentiate the, the micro algae and the phytoplankton, they will absorb, they will put the microplastic inside their cells. This is why we have this unique differentiation with the macro algae that only have it on the surface. You know, this scientifically is a great insight. And mind you, it's from February this year. We didn't know. It's from February this year that this was observed and confirmed by the Science University of Denmark. Okay, um, very interesting point. Uh, maybe as uh, we are a bit running on time, but uh, yeah, last questions, please. My name is Ayub Macharia from Kenya. Uh, my question goes to Mr. Shuhei Okuno, city of, Yoka, of, uh, of Yokohama. Uh, um, you, you mentioned about uh, creating public awareness in your action plan, uh, in your project. And I'm just wondering, since this is quite expensive, how, how are you doing it? Public awareness in your project. Okay, um, thank you. The Yokohama cities, uh, Mr. Okuno uh, presented uh, their project. And the interesting part was that uh, uh, small private companies, uh, they have uh, acknowledged these values of the seagrass and they actually pay to buy, buy this credit generated by this uh, uh, production of the seagrass. And with that, uh, they have uh, intensive uh, public awareness campaigns and they promote uh, that kind of initiatives in the sport event or the public event. Um, I think uh, Mr. Okuno and uh, his colleagues can tell you more about uh, uh, public awareness uh, strategies of the Yokohama city. Thank you indeed uh, for uh, pinpointing a very important point. Uh, so maybe I just uh, give a floor, uh, a round uh, of the speakers uh, uh, to give uh, final remarks, uh, maybe in uh, one minute. Uh, maybe we go from the other side, uh, Professor um, the Fujita. Um, any comments? Yeah. I enjoy this session. I have never been uh, attended to the meeting of the blue carbons, but my microplastic, removal of microplastic is the most interesting to me because the, in Japan the seaweeds are cultured so much and they are also treated as the contamination <laughs> to removing. And so washing is the largest problem. So if can the process are uh, used to the remove the microplast from the oceans, that may be uh, good news. Okay. I think. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Watanabe? Yeah. Uh, actually, I went to Namibia and uh, in this May with uh, my colleague Kobayashi-san, and uh, we found that many unutilized uh, uh, seaweed there. So. I think uh, that field, we, Japan is advanced, the usage of uh, seaweed. So I think we can find a collaboration between Japan and African countries with the use of the seaweed or yes, 
Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, James? <clears throat> Indeed, we grow a lot of seaweed, but it's designed for export in China and other countries. We never use seaweed. And here I really love it. So that's an area of collaboration uh, where, but I know it could be very hard to introduce new culture of eating what people don't eat, but it can start somewhere. So it could be one way of involving all of your institution and our institution and see which other uh, edible species we are culturing. Okay, uh, Gunther. <laughs> I would like to propose that Africa and Japan works together. Since Africa in South Africa and in Morocco are the first two countries that tested the adsorption of seaweeds with seaweed curtains, I would like to see a collaboration whereby Japan puts up the first seaweed curtains with the purpose of adsorption and removal of microplastics. Japan is such a wisdom of seaweed and such an experience of life and culture of how to farm seaweeds. It would benefit tremendously for Africa to be able to access this knowledge of the farming and those very incipient first experiences of how to absorb and generate the biogas. Because even in Japan, when they're farming the seaweed to eat, they only cut off a little piece which they eat. The most of the part of the seaweed is just discarded and creating methane gas. So we have to be very careful of how we approach it. During the voyage with our boat, when we come to Japan, we are hoping to inaugurate the first seaweed curtain in Japan for the purpose of testing the signs of adsorption of microplastics and testing the signs with these 1,400 seaweeds on how much biogas and how much phosphate can we produce. Thank you. Thank you, Gunther. Um, we really learned that the, the seaweed has multiple functions and multiple benefits and the different ways of using it. And maybe we should look at the uh, needs and the characteristics of the communities uh, to find out what is the, really the best way uh, to use the seaweed. And we had a very good discussion on the blue carbon. Uh, let's be innovative. Uh, Gunther, thank you for inspiring us. And uh, let's work together uh, to promote uh, blue carbon, uh, blue economy, and a sustainable uh, ocean and society. Thank you very much. Uh, please join me in giving a big round of applause to the four, five speakers. Thank you. それではあのこれで閉会とさせていただきます。お忘れ物のないようにあのご退席の方をよろしくお願いいたします。Thank you and please、uh, mindful of your belongings and、uh, let's meet again and thank you very much for your attendance.